Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's Speakeasy podcast episode. I've got Fousey coming on. If you've been on social media long enough, you've probably seen Fousey. He's a big influencer. Um, he's got over 20 million followers across his social. We're going to be talking about, you know, how do you grow on social media? That's a question people ask me. How do you go viral? And so we're going to talk to one of the OGs, the original people that went viral on social media, what he's doing now. You know, he's got uh, a boxing promoting company doing stuff with Jake Paul, Logan Paul. Um, he's gone through a lot. So we're going to talk about his journey, sober, talk about happy punch, talk about how things have changed on social media. So when he got 20 million followers, the rules he followed – how he's adapting to the modern world where everybody and their brothers are social media influencers. So now there's more competition, which means you have to be an adaptable machine. Remember, as Darwin taught, it's not the smartest or the strongest who survive. It's the most adaptable to the environment in which they find themselves that survive. So your ability to navigate the social media influencer world the viral world, whether you even want to be on camera or not, is irrelevant. If you want to make something in this world, you're going to need social media. Pretty much nobody's making money anymore without social media. Even Warren Buffett companies are doing social media. Let me let me shoot a quick little peek, little uh, from my Insta story. All right, we have Fousey here coming on the next episode of Speakeasy. If you're live, I've launched a big social media podcasting platform, so... Boozy, man, I want to hear about how you got 20 million social media followers, how you're promoting, doing stuff with Jake Paul, Logan Paul, your own boxing, your journey through being sober, being, you know, you've been up and you've been down. Let's talk about both because people That's need right. to hear both. Let's talk. We got a lot to talk about. We have a lot about. to Let's talk about. Talk. I got my paper here. So why don't we just jump in here with the first thing, which is a lot of my followers are entrepreneurs. And they want to, they realize it's hard to be an entrepreneur now if you're not a master of social media. You're one of the original masters of growing on social media. So let's start with this mm -hmm. question. What used to work and doesn't work anymore to grow your social media and how you adapted to new strategies? Then we're going to talk about addiction, sobriety, what you're doing with, you know, aspiration. Mm -hmm. But let's start with this question right at the beginning, like, what used to work to grow to 20 million followers like you have that doesn't work at all anymore? Yeah. You know, and, you know, just right off the top, if I were to think of the first answer that comes into my mind, it's actually an interesting answer because what used to work is just simply creating, going with your intuition, having a vision and creating and putting it out there. That was before algorithms and the system came into play. Because now you can no longer have a good picture or a good video ready to go and be like, I'm just going to upload this. Because now you have to strategize. Am I posting at the right time? How, when was the last time I posted? Um, are my followers active? So you have to, you have to strategize so much more yeah. now within what you're doing. So when I started, because I'm an artist that lives with his heart on his sleeve. So my favorite thing to do was if I wanted to post three YouTube videos a day, I could do that before. If I wanted to post four Instagram pictures a day, I could do that before. But now it's as if like the algorithm and the system has a rope on my back and it's pulling me back because I can't even post, I can't even be as active as I wanna be on my socials because of you know, the powers that be and the system you're playing against. So it's like, you're now battling against the algorithms, whereas before you could just do yeah. you. So you have to think now, like, is the algorithm favoring this eight-second videos or 45-second videos? Am I on a topic? So Am I much. Mean, funny enough? I mean, I feel like it's a race to being crazier and crazier. Like, you know what I mean? It's like you used to be able to just shoot a YouTube video where you're sharing. But now if you look at what's winning, it's like some crazy – prank or something like that so that's interesting what's your favorite social platform right now what do you think let's say somebody's 
Pat doesn't have 20 million followers. I have 9 million followers across platform. Mm. They're not somebody who's already built early. And you, so you're, let's say you're starting all over again. What platform are you building on now? Mm. So it's, it's interesting because that question is contingent to 2022. Because in the past, I would say YouTube. Because the reason why after I started in 2011, the reason why I'm still, I can't walk out of my house without, no matter where I go, no matter where in the world, I'm going to get stopped. And Fusi is because of the, the impact I had made on YouTube, because YouTube was the epicenter of everything yeah. back then. So the, the, the 10 million subscribers on FusiTube, the 4 million on Dose of Fusi, the fitness channels, the podcasts I've done, my face is out there. Um, and, and, and that kept everything alive. So YouTube used to be the epicenter. And then I used YouTube to funnel into Instagram, funnel into my other social media apps. Now it's different. My favorite bar none was Instagram. And it still is Instagram for what I like to the, the brand that I like. Like if I were to say, where's my audience right now? I'd say Instagram because they have got a day-to-day -day update of my journey. Whereas YouTube, I might not have posted in six months. They don't know that I'm now sober. I'm now healthy. I have a boxing match coming this year. They remember what they last saw of me on YouTube. Instagram, they see me day to day, but that's still not the answer to your question. The best social media to start on that I give everybody now, yeah. hands down, is TikTok. And I used to hate it because I used to be like, people would walk around like, oh, you know, I'm viral on TikTok. I got 1 million views. And I would be like, a million views on TikTok. Like, that's nothing to like, <laughs> but that's just like, my, my grandma yeah. could get a million views on TikTok. So I hated it until I realized the benefit of it. And I was like, wait, why be mad at it if I could use right. it to my advantage? Because a lot of the, you know, that's where people are right now. And that's where people are consuming so much. It's easy to get a million views. So let's run yeah. those numbers up. So now any reel that I post on Instagram, I also post on TikTok. And nine out of 10 times, TikTok yeah. numbers blow it out the water. It goes viral instantly on TikTok. So people who haven't seen me in years now, like I'm just on their For You page. I'm there. I'm there. So it reignites them. It reminds them of who I am, what I am, and it gets them if they're interested enough to let me click his Instagram. Let me see what he's doing there. Let me click his YouTube. Let me see what he's doing there. So whenever a person comes up to me, yo, Fusi, I want to be a social media star, which everybody yeah. does nowadays, um, and everybody is nowadays, I just say TikTok. Start on TikTok and you know use that to leverage into the other platforms you want to be on. Yeah, I'm finding like for me, I do the same thing. I I build a piece of content into and and I bought bodybuilding.com the uh, last week, so now I control bodybuilding, which got five million YouTube. You know, it's a big, big company. Bo bodybuilding, that's huge. Yeah, yeah I I've been working on that deal. Congrats. Thank you, man. I've been huge. working on the deal for two years and two months. You want to buy companies, do the stuff I do. You gotta be patient. I'm sure you've learned that, you know, in your journey. But one of the things that I see, it's funny. Like the main thing I see happening on Instagram versus TikTok, sometimes my Insta for myself personally and bodybuilding, which has a huge Insta, is that sometimes I still get more views on Reels. But if you look at your activity page, nobody follows anymore. All my follow growth is happening on TikTok. I'm talking, I did the post the other day. It got about a million on TikTok about whatever, a million on Insta, okay, in the first 24 hours. The interesting thing, though, I was getting 20 follows like a minute on TikTok from that video and like one wow. every hour on it. Like, and no, so Instagram is the static place. If you already have followers, you need to post to Insta because there's people already there. But if you want to grow, I mean, I'm worried about Instagram. Like, if there's no growth, it's death. Is I know why Mark Zuckerberg switched to the name Meta and Metaverse. So that's what I see. It's like, yeah. Yeah, so I, I want to read these numbers to you. So I run a promotional company in the boxing scene called Happy Punch Promotions. Yep. One of our biggest places right now is Instagram. The numbers for last month, our reels got 20.2 million views. We had 35 million total impressions. 
We had 14.3 million accounts reached, which was a growth of 502,000. But at the end of the day, we only had 25,000 new yeah. followers. Granted, 25,000 is a huge, huge feat and milestone. But you have my co-founder talking with me like, why aren't we like, why, is, why aren't people following? They, it, it doesn't, they're not, it's not converting. People are stalking the page. People are yes. watching the page. It's reaching the pages. But people aren't following. Yes. They're not. They're not clicking that follow button. Whereas TikTok, like you said, it's yeah. it's it's a much. We get those numbers, but we also get the 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 followership behind yeah. it. That's awesome. So let's switch. We'll come back. I want to come back because there's questions people are going to ask um, as we do this live. On the side of this is awesome, by the way. This is my first time on this app, and this is I'm liking this. I'm about to blow this up. We just came out of beta. We got about thirty thousand people on Speakeasy. I'm gonna push it to like three million here by the so this will be a good place. We'll talk on doing some more podcasts and building you here. Um, but appreciate that. Uh, let's talk about like your journey, like being sober. A lot of people <laughs> in this world deal with addictions my dad was a alcoholic and drugs you know my mom wasn't it was interesting like some of it's genetic they found and and mm -hmm. so my mom was like you know ty when my when my mom and dad were married they used to do drugs right because my dad was a drug dealer but my mom's like i would do it but the second she got pregnant with me she's like i knew it was bad for the baby i stopped overnight my dad can never stop so i've been around people who are like sober, like my mom mm -hmm. and not addict. And I've been, you know, my real dad. Um, and that ended up really killing my dad in the end was all the re repercussions of drinking a lot more drinking more than drug. My dad always said, I only do the, the healthy drug. So he do weed mushroom. He's like, I don't do anything that's mm -hmm. man-made, you know, mm -hmm. but still alcohol is pretty man-made. And so what's kind of, like through your journey through soberness or to soberness, mm -hmm. if somebody's listening and they're struggling with any kind of addiction, like if you had to start by saying the simplest piece of advice that's practical for somebody struggling with any kind of addiction, what would be your advice to them? <laughs> this is this is an interesting question because like and, and it's funny because you're asking me on the spot. So it's just the first thing that pings in my brain. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this would be a controversial take, but these are these are things that I literally told myself on my journey. So I say I don't say them to like condemn. I like others. controversy. I'm controversial, so say well, the controversy. My my simple take is like I have, for example, um, I used to vape twenty four seven, whether it be on an airplane whether it be in a doctor's office, whether it be at my grandma's house, whether it be on this podcast, you would, you would, you would have me vaping. So whenever anybody is wondering like, you know, what is wrong? What am I doing wrong? You know what it is. You know what it is. You know what your issues are because you're using those vices every day. Um, and see, I'm trying to think of, Take your time, no rush. Yeah. Um, so okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna rephrase. Actually, we're gonna go a different way. I was gonna say, you know what the problem is. So like, if I when I used to be overweight, but I would eat every single night, I knew what my problem was. So it's not like, you know, why why am I overweight? What's going wrong? Oh, if I look down at what I'm doing, and I say that to say when I before I went to rehab, I you know. When I got into rehab, they take away your phone, they take away your laptop, they take away your your vapes, they take away everything. So what I started doing while I was in rehab was going to sleep at a normal hour, waking up at a normal hour, eating at a normal hour, um, not vaping. And what I started noticing was I started feeling better. I started getting energy. I started being happier. So when I look back at the way I was living in L.A. before I went there, I was like, okay, let me break this down to myself. I wake up at about 4 p.m. The first thing I do before my eyes even open is hit my vapes to get that initial like, ah. You know, I stay in bed for an additional two hours. I start ordering junk food. I probably watch porn and masturbate. 
I might end up going to a massage parlor and getting some, you know, extra services. I go home. By the time it's like midnight, 1 a.m., I start eating again. The last thing I see in my eyes is porn before I close my laptop. Last thing I do before sleeping is hit my vape. I wonder why I was so miserable. So it's like when I started looking back at how I was living as opposed to what I was doing to like, I used to think I needed Adderall to give me natural human energy. Now with sleeping good, you know, not vaping, not taking any substances, eating well, I have so much energy where people now think I'm on something all the time. They're like, what's this guy on? Not understanding that now I unlock the natural energy that I thought I, you know, that I thought was taken away from me, even though I'm still so young. And the last thing I want to say before, because I'm, this is kind of all over the place, but I was begging my audience to like, uh, you know, join. I, I tell everybody I know to not vape because that literally it destroyed me. Vaping destroyed me. We think that vaping is to alleviate our anxiety, but it's actually induces our anxiety and just makes everything worse. So one guy hit me up and he was like, you know, Fousey, I can't stop vaping. If I don't vape, I don't go to sleep. He was like, what should I do? I said, a sleepless night isn't going to kill you. You're going to be uncomfortable. You're going to hate it. But if you know that you can't sleep without you vape, then you're always going to need that vape to be able to get yourself to sleep. But if you actually wanted to quit, go that sleepless night. Go two sleepless nights. It's not going to kill you, but go through that moment of uncomfortability to get to the other side, just like when people do on harder drugs when, you know, they're going through their withdrawals. Yeah. So it's like the success of quitting something requires the sacrifice and requires the pain and everything else that, you know, that comes along with it. So one of the things you're saying is like go back to nature, which is like na- natural environment. Very few people stayed up till four in the morning. You didn't have electricity. Sun got dark. Uh, sun went down, got dark. You went to bed. So get into bed a reasonable mm-hmm. hour. Yeah, you know, stuff like vaping, weed, all this. You know, I have six brothers. One of them's a heroin addict, sadly. Uh, nicest guy in the world, but struggle with that since he was really young. It's like do the little things right because everybody's kind of like, what's the massive thing? that gets my life on track. It's like, there's a book called, you know, make your bed. It's like, get in a little habit where you get it right. I read that while I was actually at my last stint in rehab and that impacted me great. Yeah. It's by a Navy Admiral. And it's just like, start building micro habits. I have a professor, uh, mentor, uh, professor Baumeister, and he's a famous professor. And he wrote a book called willpower. Like, and one of the things he says is willpower is just what you say. A lot of people go, okay, I'm struggling with food, sex, drugs, rock and roll, all that kind of stuff. So the way I'm going to fight it is just like, go, uh, I'm going to have more willpower. But he's like, willpower is weak. So he says, for example, at night, you have less willpower because your brain is tired. Mm-hmm. So go to bed because if you stay up till three in the morning, you're more likely to eat junk food late at night. So simple mm-hmm. pivots and habits actually fix the big stuff. There's an old saying, little leaks sink big ships. The Titanic mm. was a huge boat, basically the biggest passenger boat in human history. And it sunk with a little like six or 12 foot hole in it. And so your life, mm-hmm. if you can go back to nature. Freud, Sigmund Freud, the psychologist, wrote a book, Civilization and Its Discontents. And he basically said modern civilization causes a domino effect of a lot of problems. Like you said, there used to not be porn. If you if you have if every dude knows on their phone they can access naked beautiful women, it's tough for people to fight that, right? That willpower. So a good thing is like you said, I tell some people, go on one of these wilderness um like survival camps where you got to leave your phone for a week, all of a sudden you're back Mm -hmm. to nature and it becomes, now it'll be, Mm -hmm. like you said, it'll be hard for that first night to sleep because you don't have your vape pen, you don't have your phone, but all of a sudden you get tired because you're chopping wood all day. Like go back to nature. Mm -hmm. It's not the end all be all, but 
Yeah, that's that's interesting. All right, let's come back to that in a second. I want to go through and talk about Happy Punch and being a promoter. Yeah. We know now, like, boxing has blown up. Conor McGregor went from MMA, switches over to boxing. Logan Paul, Jake Paul, Mayweather fights Logan. Like, I, I've known, you know, Jake and Logan for a while, um, and and it's just insane – how combat sports now are the thing. So how'd you get the idea for to pivot like, all right, happy punch. Let's talk about you got a fight coming up. Can't say who you're fighting. It's a surprise for everybody. But tell me about your foray into this MMA combat world. Okay. So, you know, YouTube boxing became a thing um, in the UK. Right. Uh, it was when Joe Weller uh, had a fight, and then after that fight, called out KSI. KSI Joe Weller happened. KSI wins, calls out any of the pulls. Logan Paul, Jake Paul, I'll take you on it. That was the psh, that was the explosion. Um, so now it makes sense that like when when two influencers are fighting, it's more than just them fighting. It's two fan bases amongst right. each other. Um, and it's like, no, my guy's going to win. No, my guy's going to win. And it's just, it, it creates the banter for itself. And then in the ring, it's like, it's peak entertainment. So last year, I actually was involved in a boxing match before um, when the, in the early stages of this YouTube boxing. But I did what a lot of these influencers do before it became serious and went in there with just my ego. Because my ego as an influencer was so big at the time before I killed my ego where I was like, you know, I could do whatever. Nobody can stop me. I, I'm going to beat this guy up. But I'm saying that with no skill to back up what I'm saying. I just said that with straight ego and I got annihilated. Who'd you fight? I beat to the – this gentleman named Slim, another YouTuber. I had one month of training, um, knew nothing about what I was doing, went in there in London in enemy territory and got annihilated. Yeah. So that's why this fight, which I'll talk about, means so much to me because this is like my redemption arc. But last It's like Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan till I punch him in the face. <laughs> so it's like everybody's cocky till you get in a ring and you realize now it don't matter who you are. It's pure skill, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so last year, Social Gloves was happening, which was um, YouTube versus TikTok. So now you had like somebody was actually trying to monopolize the idea of like, yo, this is going to be a thing. Let's turn it into something. YouTubers, TikTok, let's run it. So what I did at the time, because I've always found ways to reinvent myself in my career, even when I've been down and out. And that's why after all these years, I'm still here, talked about have this fight going on because I, I always found different ways of to make it. So when Social Gloves was happening... I showed up to the gym where they were having open tryouts on, and I uh, simply started interviewing the fighters, the YouTubers, and recording. Pretty soon, people started calling me Dana Tube because I was like the reporter of the social media <laughs> influencer. And it's like anything that was happening in social media boxing, you go to my new YouTube channel, you see it, and like I covered everything. That ended up getting me a role to be the ring, uh, the ring announcer for that event in Miami. After that ring announcing in, uh, opportunity, I, had, uh, I got signed by a new manager, and then I had the idea. I was like, wait, there are no promotional companies in this space. There are no companies that are repping these fighters. That are, uh, there's no media for all these fighters. Like, We need to turn this bigger than just Dana Tube. I needed to make it bigger than myself. So I conceptualized the idea of Happy Punch Promotions. At the time, all it was going to be was me and Keemstar were going to be the media entity for everything that happened. So if you, if you have a boxing event and you need it promoted, talked about, publicized, come to me and Keem. We'll cover it on all our fronts. Um, if you needed commentators, we'll commentate. You needed interviews, we'll interview. And then as it was going on, I was like, wait, this can be bigger than that. Just like promotional companies in boxing, let's start signing some of these fighters. So never done before, we started signing some of the biggest names. Speed, who's one of the biggest uh, live streamers out there right now. Gideon, who's one of the biggest YouTubers and social media stars out there right now. Salt Poppy, 
who was in an event um, earlier this year. He was the first fight of the night, but became fight of the night and became an instant overnight star. And what we started doing now is now we had a stable of a bunch of happy punch fighters. And any event that's happening comes to us of, hey, who should we put on our card? How do we promote? So now we're all in one package. Boom. Put so, so uh, put Salt Poppy on. Put Dean the Great on. Put Gideon on this fight. Put Fusi on the fight. Keem will handle the commentary. We'll do the media publicity on this front. And now it's just like a well-oiled machine that, like, it's become the go-to spot for influencer boxing. Um, hmm. I, I think it's going to be capital. Like, we're early in on this. Like, nobody... Nobody has done what we are doing, and that's why we were establishing ourselves to be the go-to spot. And that, like with those yeah. numbers that I read earlier, like people are it, they're receptive to it. it, it it's being it's be, it's going according Sorry, to plan. Did you say that again? Hmm. Yeah, it's a, I mean the bit that business people are underestimating. You look at the fight numbers on some of these influencers fighting, and the pay-per-view numbers is like boom. It's like competing with like UFC numbers. You know, because so, UFC, yeah. a lot of UFC people don't have big social media followers, especially, but but everybody you could put on a card, even the undercards, you could be getting people that have 2 million TikTok, you know what I mean? So it's an interesting business strategy. Yeah, for example, like August 27th, it just got announced, KSI is making his return to the ring, and his last opponent hmm. was Logan Paul at the Staples Center. He fought him twice. Yep. So KSI, the king of the UK... Now, business partners with Logan Paul and Prime Hydration and all that is returning to the ring in the O2 Arena in London on the zone. Hmm. Like wow. the, the the magnitude of how big that event is going to be, fighters and fighters who do this on a daily basis, like this is their blood, sweat, and tears, couldn't yeah. pay for that kind of promotion and publicity that sure. this kind of card is going to have because – uh, alone with the 20,000 venue that's going to be instantly sold out because his pre-sale tickets sold out instantly. The zone, like especially with it being KSI, millions of people are going to tune in. And that's before all the views pour in to the TikToks that it's going to generate, the YouTube that it's going to generate, the Instagram that it's going to generate, and all for an influencer. But the yeah. good thing about it now is, and, you know, Jake Paul has already been the proof to the pudding to show that, like, it's not, boxers can't look at it anymore and be like, oh, this social media stuff is, you know, it's a joke because these influencers are now taking it serious. Yeah. They're not just going out there to, you know, do a, a joke of the sport and do, they're doing, they're training like professionals. They're doing yes. all they can as professionals and they're, they're pulling the numbers. It's all about numbers at the end of the day. And I, you know, I, uh. People also always ask me, Ty, what do you think of Logan and Jake Paul? And I'm like, these are big corn-fed Midwest boys. They got big backs. I've learned, I've done, you know, martial arts. Or I started with judo. Now I do Brazilian jiu-jitsu and just just amateur. But you know, I I've sparred with pro guys, and these dudes with big backs, you don't want to box. That's why I look. People think even if Jake Paul's form isn't, you know, like Canelo or something, somebody who's but you get hit square with a dude who's strong, strong back. Some of them, it's not just biceps. A lot of people are like, oh, look at biceps. I'm like, it's back. You got to, and being strong thighs where you're planted strong. So I was telling him, you don't want to fight the, you know, Jake, Jake's put a few people to sleep uh, that are strong <laughs> dudes. So are you, so let's talk about healthier. Cause like I said, I own bodybuilding.com and, I, I like talking mm -hmm. about training. My dad was a pro bodybuilder. Um, what's your – walk us through a training day. You're taking this seriously. What's the day? Mm -hmm. What's the cardio? What's the weights? What's the technique? What's kind of your breakout? What's your, you know, your routine? So are you asking for me – as in my boxing training camp or me in general, just my yes. training healthy. No so boxing train. Let's talk about boxing training camp first. Okay. Um, <laughs> hopefully my opponent isn't watching this because every, okay. Don't say all the confidential stuff. Just give a big, big, big picture. Okay. Don't get too okay, confidential. Okay. I don't want to mess up the fight. I don't want that responsibility <laughs> on my shoulders, but like, what's the general it's, thing? Like, are you it's doing literally so, you know, 20%, an hour of cardio, an hour of weight. So first of all, you know, a lot of, of all, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a full-time investment. 
it's like if you want to do this right and you truly want to do it, it's a full time investment. There's like there's no more hanging out with friends. There's no more um, having time to do your hobbies. One, even if you wanted to, you couldn't because you're walking around so angry and so stressed and so like, you know, <laughs> built up that you couldn't do that. But a normal day would be wake up early. Now, some boxers choose to um, run early in the morning. Um, I personally don't. Um, and it depends on your preference of what you like. Because I like all my initial energy to be exerted into my training, my boxing training session that day. So then I'll do a full, uh, full-blown boxing training. Um, it starts with jump rope. I'm not going to say the amount of time for jump rope, but it's an insane amount of time to jump rope just to, just to warm up into the training. Then you go into the fundamentals, whatever we're going to do that day, whether it be bag work, whether it be mitt work, um, whether it be, you know, feet work, whatever it's going to be. And then it could end in a, a full blown sparring, uh, sparring session where, you know, you're, you're go like, what we're doing to prepare is harder than the actual fight night of the fight because it is so grueling and so difficult. So you'll, you'll go for sparring, which in my case, I'll get my ass beat um, and just whooped on and, and break into the core. So by the time that's done, the time is like 2 o'clock. And, you know, normally it's like, okay, let's go home. Let's do something. All it is is take the one, two hours that you need get a quick meal in because now the biggest thing is I use food as fuel as opposed to use few food for entertainment and to like mitigate my whatever feelings I'm feeling frustrated, stressed, whatever I used to eat. Now food is fuel. So if I need, I, I need food for fuel, I'll eat, I'll get ready. I'll then go back to the gym. Then it's strength and conditioning. So then it's working on those thighs that you talked about, working on those back that you talked about, working on, you know, just what, what am I lacking on? What do I need to fix? Is it my hips? Is it my legs? Is it, is it my back? Like what, based on my sparring and my performance that day, what do I need to work on? And me yeah. being the crazy person that I am these days, even after that, that's when my runs come in. So after all that, I like to end my night with a run. And that could be anywhere yeah. from, it could be a speed run that day. So an hour of a speed run, it could be eight miles that day. It could be 12 miles that day, but I'll run. By the time I'm done, I'll put another meal into my body. It's time to go to sleep with all my aches and bruises, wake up the next morning and do it all over again. Are you doing massage, cold, hot, cold, oh, baths, oh, yeah. uh, hydrotherapy, oh, you yeah. know? cryo all that stuff. And everything that that i can or else my body wouldn't it like my body wouldn't be able to um put up with the the the, the stress that i'm putting on it um yeah. so and if, if i am doing a massage it's a sports therapy massage it's a it's a i forgot the name of it of what my guy does but like he releases something in my tissues uh yeah like deep is, tissue that, yeah. that is so yeah. freaking painful um the way that he does it <laughs> Um, the coach put, makes us sit in the ice bath for 15 minutes where, you know, you, you, you rethink your entire, your entire existence <laughs> and why am I doing Come to this? Jesus bath. <laughs> You're like, Yo. and then cryo, um, vitamin IVs, like anything and everything to just, you know, help, you know, get yourself to be able to perform at the, the heights that you're performing at. So diet for a second you hit on it what's the food that like I, michael jordan there's a famous biography of michael jordan before a game before a basketball game he would eat a steak he said the only thing that could fuel him was a steak now you got mm -hmm. vegan athletes you have you know i'm friends with some of the los angeles lakers like meta world peace want to ring with kobe he told me like here's my routine i need to nap two minutes mm -hmm. two hours you know at one o'clock before the game and here's my food you know, he likes salmon and fish and stuff like that. Like, what's your go-to food that makes you able to train at a high level? Okay. And this, I, 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 whenever I speak to this, like you said, I want everybody to know it's whatever works for your body. Whether it's yeah. being a vegan, whether it's being a pescatarian, I don't even know all the names of things. But whatever works for your body. Because, like, when I tell my brother, who's also, he loves lifting at 40, he transformed his whole body, he was obese with kids, but now he's ripped and shredded, you know, when I tell him my diet plan, he'll tell me it's bullshit and explain why his is better. 
And then if I take his <laughs> diet plan and go to somebody else, somebody else will take their time explaining why my brother's is bullshit and why theirs is better. So at the end of the day, it's whatever works for you. So me personally, what I have found is, and this has been the number one, I, I've, I've been a yo-yo dieter my whole life. I'll be, I'll be ripped and shredded, I'll be fat. I'll be ripped and shredded, I'll be fat. And I can explain that if you'd like because that goes into the addiction and what I was trying to fix by fixing my image without fixing what's on the inside. But what I have learned is carbs are the devil. Sugar is the devil. I used to think, oh, I need energy. I need carbs. So let me eat some bread. Let me eat some rice. Let me do this. Let me do that. When I tell you that when I eliminated that from my diet completely, any sugar, any sugar, let alone processed sugar. So first I started with keto. I just started with meats and I started with healthy fats. And immediately I started realizing, holy crap, I don't feel as sluggish as I used to. My brain isn't foggy. I have more energy than I used to than when I used to eat a big, uh, you know, carb loaded meal to give me energy to work out. So I started learning how to access the fat storage that, you know, that we have for energy. My body started adapting differently. But when I was doing that, I always used to tell myself, oh, but I miss fruit. I miss acai bowls. So I found this gentleman on Instagram who changed my life. So now my diet consists of straight protein from the source. Straight, like I'm talking two pounds of protein on a daily basis. And I'm, the, the thing that I don't put on it is I don't put the, the, the teriyaki sauce with all the sugars and the added sugars and everything. I'm talking just salt and pepper. And if I'm going to use something, I use butter, not even oils. And um, then I get my fats. I'll have my avocados. I'll have my eggs. But the best part about it now is I get all my carb sources and my sugar sources from a natural source, which was given to us from the day, you know, we've been out here is fruit. Mm. I, a ton of fruit. Now I eat as much fruit as I want in a day and I have never felt better. My body has never looked better. I've never performed better. So when I walk into a grocery store now and I see something with additional added sugars, to me, it's an, an immediate toss out, let alone huh. if it has sugars, I, I, I should toss that up. But some days I'm like, okay, I'll allow myself to, you know, have this or have that. But um, to me, sugars, um, anything processed, anything with carbs used to be my kryptonite, used to be my devil. It, it, it was holding me back. I like that. So basically, you're getting your meats and your and your fats from the traditional keto, but you're throwing in the fruit, which has the fiber, the pectins, natural, and then that gives you a little bit of carbs. I like that. I'm going to try that. I like that. It's, it's, it's basically like when you, when you talked about, oh, before porn was a thing and the sun went down, like people had to go to sleep. Right. So I eat what, what we used to have back in the day, like an animal-based diet. So yes. protein comes from the animals, um, eggs, uh, fruit comes from nature you know it comes from there so everything that i have is stuff that was is actually like here for us already in the earliest of civilization before we started going into factories and turning you know these crazy things and being like boom eat this yeah. boom eat that like when i go into a grocery store now and i see some of the things on the kids aisles for children and you oh, grab yeah, it and tragedy. you look at it's and you wonder like I, it, the system is set up for us to fail yeah, I tell people it's that one ingredient diet where it's like apple. What's the ingredient? An apple. It's a steak. One ingredient, steak, cow. And the second that ingredient list starts to grow, now you're going away from God, nature, and you're going into the man-made. Mm -hmm. And man messes up more stuff than they fix. Um, let, let me. I Brookie, want to Brookie just asked. Go ahead, Brookie yeah. just asked an important question. She said, what about clean water when a lot of it is sold in plastic bottles? Yes. So uh, a friend of mine, Roman Atwood, actually put me on because I, I drink water like it's nobody's business. I'm talking one training session. I'm already done with my gallon. And then I'm on to my second gallon of the day. And one of my friends actually put me on is, no, don't drink out of plastic because, you know, 
everything that's coming out of the plastic. So what I do now, because obviously I have to be realistic for my own self and I can't get like, as of right now, a giant thing to make my water in my house. So even if I do buy it out of a plastic bottle, I pour it immediately into my metal jug and I carry it around uh, that way. Um, <laughs> yeah, but water is, water is, I actually do water fast. Like right now I'm on a water fast. You saw me drinking black coffee, but when I'm on a water fast, I allow black coffee, no cream, no sugar. So from now until Monday morning, I'm not eating a single thing. Ooh, that'll lean you right up. Not a, that'll lean you right up. Water. Not, not only that, <laughs> but it discipline, it disciplines me. It resets my body from using the carbs that I may have in my system and whatever for energy and adapts me to using my fats. And I actually like, I perform better. I'm more clear and I don't waste any time of the day thinking, what should I eat today? Did I eat today? Do I have energy? Because I end up having so much more energy this way. It's insane. So question on that, because people are loving. I saw a quick, let's start to do Q and A, by the way, um, as we get to this part of the show. So I'm going to go back. If anybody has questions let, on any subject, for Fousey, myself, one of the questions that caught my eye here, what do you, what's your take on things like sweet potatoes for carbs? Do you do any potatoes or sweet potatoes or just fruit? I, I don't. Um, and the, the gentleman who I follow on Instagram, it, like that's who I usually uh, tell people to defer to because I don't know the sweet science of why he doesn't do it and why he doesn't allow it. But um, I don't do any kind of potato. Are you allowed? Can you share um, his uh, Instagram name? Or is that okay? Yeah, yeah, his name is Carnivore MD. Oh, I know him. He's the he's like a doctor. He always is without a shirt. Like he's in the grocery store. I'm like, bro, you might be getting yeah, thrown out of yeah. a few uh, Whole Foods here. But uh, and he just goes bullshit, bullshit, yes. bullshit. Like his number one shirt says, "Kale is bullshit." <laughs> so like he just. I like, boy, that ain't going to make you popular in L.A. Hollywood is king of kale. All you had to do is say (laughs) kale. Sometimes, you know, my mom's vegan. I got her to be vegan, even though I'm not vegan. I I like to cycle through different diets. I think that's healthy, too. And, um, but sometimes you go to vegan restaurants. Like, I was in L.A., and I'm going, this is junk food here. Like, the whole point that the vision of vegan was not vegan junk food. It wasn't deep fried potatoes you know what i'm saying and so you got to be careful whatever diet you're on leave it to mankind they're gonna Mm -hmm. mess it up so i was like you you go keto i know people are keto and okay well technically there's junky stuff that still doesn't have carbs so you got to be be careful who you listen to okay question um but before you yeah. ask a question or as you're finding the question, I want to say um, to a lot of people listening, one of the, the, the things that helped me best in my diet and finding what worked for me as well was creating an intermittent fasting yeah. window. So when I, when I didn't have a window, I'd wake up in the morning and I'd start eating. And then after a couple of hours, you I tell yourself, I need to eat again. I need to eat again. And then at nighttime, before you go to bed, you find yourself snacking. If you discipline yourself to a window – whether it be an eight hour window, a six hour window, like let's say you eat from 12 to eight. If it's before 12, you know automatically it's before 12. I can't yeah. eat anything. If it's after eight, you don't have to worry about, oh, I need to eat, I need to eat. You don't have to eat anything. And the best thing about that is when I was doing that, some days I would get so busy, eight o'clock would hit and I realized, crap, I haven't eaten. So then I started teaching myself, but I'm still good. I'm still functioning. Uh, let's just fast until tomorrow. And I started reaping the uh, results of fasting for longer windows. And now here I am doing three-day fasts and eight-day fasts and just longer. What's your normal intermittent? Are you doing 12 to 8 when you can eat? What's the window you use mostly now? So the thing that worked best for me, um, granted it's changing now in boxing because I just I'm eating more out of the – the stress component to give myself comfort out of like getting my ass beat every day. The best that worked for me was, and this, I, anything that I say, I'm not telling people to do. I'm just saying what worked for me. I ate everything in one massive meal. So I'd fast the entire day, all my training sessions, everything. And then at night I get to eat a a lump sum of food, get to eat it all. And I eat quick, but I get, I felt so full that right after that, it's like, good, I'm good now. 
Now let me go to sleep. Everything I just ate, I'll use tomorrow during my training because it's going to be stored energy until nighttime comes again and I have to eat again. Yeah, Becca Swanson, She, I train with her sometimes. She's the strongest woman in modern history. Guinness Book of World Records. She benched 600 pounds, squatted uh, over 800 pounds, deadlifts over 700 uh, and she would do that. She would do a one huge, like 5,000 calorie meal. She's like, I have a bunch of different things, you know. Now, let's, if you want to come up, Josh, use on, Josh was here. Uh, he, if you want to come into the Q&A, we'll take a few people. We have a Q&A line. If you want a q and I want to say something about yeah. your audience. Your the, What I've noticed from this app, like, you asked earlier, what's your favorite app? And there's so many apps I hate because of how toxic people are in the comments. This is such, um, and granted, it's the energy you put out and what you curated and stuff. But to everybody listening right now, you guys have, have been great in the comments, asking real questions, taking, uh, like, you, you, like you're, you're real normal people with, like, you're not there to send out hate or negativity or toxic energy. And it's very much appreciated amongst all the apps that literally, you know, destroy the brain. Well, I appreciate it. I hope to get you. I want, well, I want to talk to you offline on being a part of this because I'm just coming out of beta. We got all the tech done, and it's a bad – it's a scalable app. So if you have a question, um, Josh is going to add some people to the uh, – we have a, a Q&A line. You can come in and unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, Joshua will moderate it. But – and I'll also read some questions – on the actual, uh, if you're too shy to ask a question live, think of grow rich. I, what books, you know, I love books, man. What books, if any, you know, some people are motivated by books, some aren't, but has there been a book that, that you look back and go, Elon Musk says he was super depressed as a teenager and he read the book, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And it made him realize there's more than even mm -hmm. earth. And now he's building SpaceX. And he said that was a pivotal book. Any pivotal books we should be reading that you like? Well, the, there's two. The first one is going to be generic and very simple. But at the time of reading, which was early on in my career, changed my life dramatically. And this is before social media took the turn. Like when I used to be on YouTube, on like my blogging channel, when I used to talk about depression, it was at the point where depression was still taboo and people used to say they were young and they were, you're lying about this. You're lying about this for views. It's not real. And whenever I used to talk about manifestation and the law of attraction, they used to think I was a lunatic. Although I was manifesting right in front of their eyes. Like I was in my car vlogging saying, I can't wait to be on stage at the VH1 Streamies accepting my award for creator of the year and saying, and I would say the words, and literally three months later, I'm on stage at VH1 winning that award with the exact words that I said. And the book that got me to do that at the yeah. time was The Secret. Like, just early on, my first, my first dive into manifestation and, you know, The Secret just opened my eyes to literally becoming what I'm thinking. Like, and wondering, like, why is so much bad happening into my life? But then when I look back into my uh, into what's going on up here, being like, oh, I thought that into existence. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm creating this reality for myself. You know, how do I expect to be skinny if I'm walking around telling myself I'm fat, I'm fat, I'm fat, I'm overweight, I'm overweight. You tell yourself you're fat and overweight, you're going to be fat and overweight because that's what you told yourself up in here. What you think is what you become. What you What you think is what your reality becomes. But the second greatest book that ever impacted my life, especially with my crazy journey of, you know, finding finding this version of myself was The Monk mm, Who Sold His yeah. Ferrari. The problem with that book is I used to think it was a true <laughs> story. So when, when I went through like a severe mental breakdown through social media at my younger years and everything, I did exactly what the gentleman did in the book. I packed my bags, I gave away all my belongings, I went to Bali, and I started like my own spiritual, I was meeting with monks, I was doing all these things until I realized, crap, it wasn't a real, a real book. Now, it doesn't take away anything, but that book was life-changing for me in so many more ways than one. Good question. Mental training. Yeah, so, 
so yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, and and mental, especially in boxing, is so important because I could get my physical like as great as I want if my mental isn't right when I step in that ring. It's game over. And that's why the first thing that I did actually in preparation for this return to the ring that I'm making is I got a breathing coach and I got a meditation coach um, who do, who's who been doing sound therapy with me and just, you know, uh, working on my breathing and be able to get myself into the state that I need to be in. Because I remember the last time that I stepped into the ring, I blacked out before even walking out to the fight because I had just lost myself. The adrenaline took over and I had lost myself. So now I'm doing, I'm doing the breathing work. I'm doing the, the, the meditation work. Um, and for myself every day, because my, it's so jam packed, I can't get myself to, that's usually just one to two times a week. Um, I give myself time to meditate and do a breathing practice that they have, train me to do on a daily basis to just always get myself back to that, you know, that, that, that center place that I need to be before I go into a day of training. Um, because I, I, I already know what's going to happen when, you know, the fight is when I'm backstage for the fight, there's going to be, you know, 20,000 people streaming their, their lives out, millions of people watching on. And if I don't protect what's going on up here, I'll get lost. So I already have, my breathing strategies and my meditation strategies and everything getting me ready awesome for that answer. Moment. Yeah. What's give us a, give us a short version of like, what are you like at one? Where are you at at six? Where are you at at 12? Like, what's that story? So I was the youngest. I had three um, other siblings and um, being the youngest, my parents were most lenient on me. So whereas like, they were strict and hard on my brothers and sisters. So, like, my brother went to Harvard. My sister went to Bolt, Berkeley and then Bolt, you know, uh, Bolt, an extension of Berkeley for law school. My other brother um, went to Berkeley and UCSD when it came to my turn. And they said, our prized child, what is he going to be? Like, we have surgeons. We have lawyers. We have pediatricians. What are you? I said, I want to go to a community college and be an actor. Um, and I ended up going to San Jose State University and pursuing, you know, my life in uh, acting. But to answer your question, because there's so many things I could delve into, what I will say is the thing about my childhood, because it affected me greatly and it caused so much of the pain I went through and the struggle that I went through is I had two very, very, very loving parents. My father did everything possible to give me whatever I needed, whether it be for school or whether it be for career. But the one thing that, and this is of no fault to him, this is just how he grew up and what he knew, he wasn't a father in the aspect of, I've never heard him say, I love you. I've never heard him say, how are you? If my phone rings till this day, I know a, ch uh, a bill or a check accidentally went to my parents' home in San Diego and my dad's calling me about that or he's calling me to see what my financial situation is looking like. So, um, and also, I, I lived a double life growing up. I actually released a book on it, but I never promoted the book or never did anything. It was called Warning, This is Not a Motivational Story, which talked about my whole addiction, my, my childhood and everything is... I lived a double life as a Muslim American because my mom was a devout Muslim and she expected me to be so. But, you know, growing up and not even knowing myself yet, let alone, you know, anything about religion, I was living two different lives. So at home, my mom would ask me, are you praying? Are you doing this? And yes, yes, yes. And then I'd leave the house, go to a party, get blacked out, drunk, smoke weed and everything. It's like, I didn't know who I was because I literally had two separate identities. And then the third identity I had was my addiction and um, the biggest addiction I had, which was my sex addiction, which was like three separate identities walking around, none of them fully knowing themselves or how to escape it. And that's a very quick answer on such a large question. But yeah, that's a bit of my childhood. Okay, so this is actually a very, very, very good question because... No matter what it is in life, if you put like, if you put your, you know, what you're doing based on somebody else, you have the chance of being let down. But the one person who you don't want to let down is yourself. And the one person who you need is yourself. Now, you already have years of experience from your trainers, which it sounds like. So it doesn't sound like you're on day one where you don't know what to do in the gym. 
the biggest thing outside of everything of what workout should I be doing? What should I be doing is developing the consistency and discipline in your life on a daily basis. So like, so you're doing what you're doing every day. Now that could be anything that could be disciplining yourself to go on daily walks, a daily at home workout routine, going to the gym, a daily jog, a daily run, and just sticking consistently and being disciplined to that plan. And also in terms of um, the diet, disciplining yourself to that, to, we know what's wrong. We like, and that's the thing I started this whole podcast by saying, we know what's wrong that we're putting into our bodies. Like, we're not like, people always ask me like, yo, what do you eat to get that shredded? But I'm like, like, you, why are you even asking that if you're still eating like a half pint of ice cream a day or a bag of chips or something like we know what's wrong. So I think the best thing for you to be w- to do is create a, a consistent disciplined plan for you that you can carry out on a daily basis that you can achieve and progress on on top of that. And like, I like to answer everything simply, like it's, it's simple terms. It's, it's instead of like, if somebody's never been to the gym and they say, yo, can you tell me your gym routine and what you work out and what you eat on a daily basis? I'm like, how about this? Wake up tomorrow, do 20 jumping jacks, do 20 push ups, do 20 sit ups and, you know, eat like three meals. And then we can start talking about, you know, where I'm at, where I'm at. I actually taught myself in the gym by going to the gym, working out, looking around and not being scared to ask people at the gym. The best trainers are people, usually you see them at the gym. They're in great physiques. They're there on a daily basis. They're disciplined. Don't be scared to walk up to them. I even do this now and I have a great physique. I walk up to somebody. They might not even have as good of a physique as I do, but I still go up to them and say, hey, I see you doing that workout. Can you teach me? Because I'm always adding to my arsenal of what I use in the gym and always changing my diet to what works. Speaking of what we were talking about earlier with social media, Nina is a prime example because before I even knew her, she would be on my explore page and my for you page all the time. And there was, there was, there was a, there was a, a, a thing about her, her skits and her reels. Like it was always of quality. It was always different and it was always unique. But the thing about Nina that always worked is from that day, from before I knew her to today, she's been consistent, disciplined, and stayed to the plan and followed through on it every single day. So it's like her followers know when she's posting, what they're getting, what kind of content they're getting. There's been like no diversion off of the route that she's on. And the success speaks for itself because her numbers have been growing, um, her, I'm not even going to talk about, uh, you know, the brand involvement of what she's done and you just see it growing. And because she stuck to the plan and stayed consistent and followed through, which is the biggest thing you can do on social media. Cause just like diets, a lot of people do it for two weeks, say, I'm not getting any results and then jump off the wagon and, you know, don't even give it time to come to fruition. But whether it was working or not working, she stuck with it. And now it's working as clear as day be so good your haters eventually ask if you're hiring some of those people are going to try to hire you as their boxy trader all right my man i'm going to end the show thank you all follow Fuzi on speakeasy and his other channels talk to you all soon